Good morning. Uh, I'm Bob Shea, Chief Investment Officer at Dynasty Financial Partners, and I'm happy to be here today with Ron and Sana, our Chief Market Strategist, and we're going to go through a 2024 outlook. I think it makes most sense to start with a recap of, of 2023. Uh, really interesting, fascinating year. Uh, wrote a piece uh, at the beginning of the year called Immaculate Disinflation. Uh, it was our outlook piece thinking uh, at the time inflation was just starting on its way down from nine and change percent to somewhere around three percent. Um, and um, my view was that it would stay higher for longer. Um, and I, I've been, you know, on the wrong side of that as inflation has come closer down to the to the Fed's uh, target of 2%. Um, and my view was that it would be very improbable without a spike in unemployment um, or, you know, or a slowing uh, of the economy. Um, Fed tightening cycle. But what I, I find interesting was, you know, we came in, we said third year of a presidential cycle, typically really good for markets, particularly following a bad 2022. So markets played out the right way, right? Market, uh, both stock market and bond market ended up uh, up after a lot of volatility in the bond market. But if you came in with a recession view and you tilted defensives, that positioning didn't play out too well. And even if you were right, no recession camp, you tilt cyclicals, <laughs> that positioning didn't work. And as you know, through September, the Magnificent Seven were pretty much 100% of the returns in the market. On November 11th, right, you know, before the Fed pivot, the equal weight S&P was actually down on the year before a, a pretty strong rally. Coming into this year, same title of outlook, immaculate disinflation. We're just coming off a CPI print that was you know, slightly above. My view is that the bond market in the move from 5% on the 10-year down to 3.8 last week or so, really priced in and hedged growth recession risks, but I think it leaves us uh, susceptible to stickier inflation. And listen, one print of the 10th percent hot is by no means, uh, you know, inflation's back. But Ron, what, what are you thinking? Um, you've really had the hot hand uh, oh, uh, and on, yeah. on everything, on the economy, markets. Uh, what, do you, what is your view? I think it's going to be a surprisingly normal year, Bob, in a certain sense, right? There's going to be a lot of noise. There's going to be political noise. There's going to be geopolitical noise. Obviously, very serious stuff that's going on in the world, and there's potentially serious political uh, activity that will take place this year. But when you separate all that out, I think when you look at the markets, and, I, and I'm still in the camp where we'll see further immaculate disinflation. I mean, I see inflation coming down. Energy prices, irrespective of what's going on in the Middle East, are really well contained. And when you look even underneath the hood, you see more downward pressure, more supply of oil being produced in the United States. When you look at other components, uh, X housing, prices are coming down. And then some of the more esoteric versions of, of inflation that the Fed looks at are within striking distance of that 2% target. So I think for me, the big story is the Fed starting to cut, inflation continuing to fall, and that puts a floor under the economy and, and provides in the fourth year of a presidential cycle the typical type of returns that you get in that period where equities are likely to be up, maybe choppy, but, but up irregularly over the course of the year. And, and then the economy probably settles into a 1.5% growth trajectory. I think there's a small risk of, of a recession still principally based on this commercial real estate issue that we have, where there's over $1.2 trillion worth of debt that needs to be refinanced over the next 18 months. And banks, while they're carrying a lot of that, are also selling off risk to hedge funds and some other institutions. So I think there's, some, there's going to be a bag holder there somewhere, and we may have a moment that accelerates the Fed's interest rate reductions. And that, again, you know, as uh, Stan Druckenmiller, famous hedge fund manager years ago, told me that bailouts are bullish. So if the Fed gets more aggressive in cutting rates because they have some concerns about a pothole in the financial system, then typically that redounds well to both bonds and stocks. Right. Um, big rally into year end. A lot of folks kind of bailed out, not to the extent that the Magnificent Seven or, or, or some growth names did. Um, but Fed pivots, Powell pivots late in the year, um, big rally, everything with a symbol rallied. Um, but if, uh, you know, we're thinking so, some of the things that were created by that pivot, which has really started into 2024 as well, is the arbitrage that was created for the banks, right? right. The, the 
uh, the BTFP um, and uh, by, by bringing down uh, the short-term interest rates created an 80 basis point uh, arbitrage rolls off March 31st but it's been a big tailwind for for banks allowing them to yeah. to, to heal um, you mentioned energy energy was fascinating right we have a war breakout in the Middle East and energy trades down 25 <laughs> percent yeah. United States production go, goes up and Just, probably will continue to this year as well yeah uh, election year. You know, we talked about the third year of a presidential cycle. Election year um, looks like, and I don't know if it's your view, it's, you know, kind of a rematch. Um, as far as we know. And is it a big deal or do we know both both uh, what what's going to happen with both uh, folks? I mean, I don't think it's a big deal prior to the election. It, you know, it, it will be afterwards, I think, depending on, well, in, in either case, it'll be a big deal because it has policy implications no matter who wins the White House and also depends on the composition of Congress. But I think, you know, there's going to be a lot of noise between now and November, um, whether it's Donald Trump saying what he says or Joe Biden defending his position. Uh, there, there's the chattering class will be talking about this nonstop because it's unusual. You have an 81 year old incumbent who may well still be impeached by the House for some reason. You have a 77-year-old former president who's been indicted four times. Um, this has no precedent in American history. And one of the strangest things I think about our, our system is if, by chance, President Trump were not only convicted but spent time in jail, he could still run for the presidency. Convicted felon, however, can't vote, so he wouldn't be able to vote for himself. So this is going to be a weird year in that regard. I mean, the, the headlines are going to be problematic. And we still have, as you pointed out, you know, these other hot spots. The Middle East could broaden out into a bigger problem. Ukraine and Russia are still going at it. Interestingly enough, as you say, the energy markets certainly haven't responded in ways that we would have expected. And so that's been a net plus for the U.S. economy. And it is, so we're producing 13.2 million barrels of oil per day. We're, again, the largest producer of oil, more to come, largest producer of natural gas, surplus gasoline in the United States, which implies downward pressure on consumer prices, food prices coming down. So I think there'll be a lot of political noise, but the underlying elements for the economy just to chug along and the markets to do reasonably well are there if you can block out the noise and separate that from the news. Um, you mentioned elections. We also have a big uh, election in Taiwan. Uh, which is um, which is obviously important, and and the last thing we need is another gigantic hotspot, uh, you know, war um, in, in, in globally, um, which which is interesting. Um, but just thinking about, you know, where we are, where how we're coming in, um, the kind of you know, it's interesting. I like to think globally, um, but uh, over the last several years, the internet, the U.S. has really been the place to be. Yeah. Um, I like to think, and, and the intellectual stimulation of thinking globally is intoxicating sometimes, yeah. uh, but the performance has been tough. Um, I've had a view that the yield curve, uh, after you know some 15 months of being inverted, will uninvert uh, this year. I think there'll be a little pressure on the, the long end, uh, where the long end you know trades up uh, and, uh, and and uninverts. Um, and what I think is uh, is interesting that would give kind of a cyclical um, kind of a vibe. Also thinking or or bias. Also thinking emerging markets. No one wants to hear about emerging markets, yeah. right? After 30 years of underperformance. But yeah. last year, one interesting thing. It's the first U.S. hiking cycle where an EM country didn't blow up, uh, yeah. which was interesting. Um, country, it's the first cycle where not a lot of things blew up. Exactly. Small banks. And that was about it. Yeah. Right? Uh, or, well, one large one. Yeah, it's 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 been interesting. How do you see the 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 uh, the tilts U.S. versus rest of world? I, you know, I still like the U.S. over most countries. I think, unlike prior cycles where people like to talk about EM as a monolithic category, it's very idiosyncratic. So I think you have to be really careful. I still hate China. Um, for a wide variety of reasons, I think their political system is not conducive to making money there, and you know the rule of law, the approach that they've taken to uh, business expansion, to foreign investment, even though in recent days they've said they were going to be friendlier, um, is somewhat risky. And so, look, it's a beaten down market. It's off 60% from its 2007 high. It's probably tempting to trade China from a tactical perspective, but I, I, it's not a place that I love. I don't think you do either. India may be interesting, up 17% last year. And then I think you kind of just, from an EM perspective, have to pick and choose. Europe, I don't get too excited about. They have still stickier inflation and still weaker growth relative to the United States. So I, I'm, I'm still kind of homebound 
in that regard. Um, it, it, and again, I think you have to be pretty tactical when it comes to, to overseas investments. I, I just don't think that you'll get as much bang for your buck, except in certain markets. Look, I mean, some emerging markets, Argentina's up 300%, but their inflation rate <laughs> is roughly coincident with that. So you kind of, who cares, right? And, and if the dollar were to weaken uh, as the Federal Reserve lowers interest rates later in the year, that does give you a kick on overseas investments. So I think that's a critical factor. Don't forget too. Japan. And Japan's ripping, right? We're at 35,000. We peaked December 31st, 1989 yeah. at just about 39,000. Exactly. So we're not too far away from an all-time high. You and I high. remember when everyone came into our office saying ex-Japan. Every product was ex-Japan. Now no it's ex-China. Now it's ex-China. <laughs> but you know, so you remember it, the, in 1987, it never really printed, the Nikkei never really printed 5,000. And Solomon, you probably remember the Solomon Brothers was a big buyer of, of the Nikkei. And from 5,000 went on to 39,000 over the course of two years and then collapsed all the way back to seven before it started to move back up. And it's been a 30-year climb back to new highs. So, you know, I, 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 Japan was great last year. It was up 20-plus percent. Um, I, whether or not they replicate that this year I think is an open question, but it's probably not a bad bet as, as, as an overseas alternative. So just in summary, uh 2024 election year. We already talked about the third year of an election. Uh, a presidential cycle is typically the strongest year for markets. Fourth year? Was second strongest. Second strongest. Yeah. Um, kind of, how do you see the year playing out? So my guess is, you know, 8 to 10 percent return on, on the major averages, you know, um, in a weird way, and I've been this is something I started talking about recently is that, that the the old normal is the new normal. I think it might be, again, ex politics, ex geopolitics, kind of a normal year like an unusually normal year. I don't think anybody's ready for that. I think that's a fairly contrary view. I think everyone thinks the world's blowing up. And look, to a certain extent, you know, we have big problems in, in certain parts of the world. But I think when you just look at the economy in the U.S. markets, if you can separate everything else out, and if, if the Fed does indeed ease, you have an argument to make that the markets will do fine and that the economy will hold up reasonably well. Again, there are probably a couple of risks out there, but my guess is it's like a one and a half, two percent growth year, and an eight to ten percent return on equities and, and, and bonds. We have a slightly different view. I think that the curve disinverts because short rates are going to come down a lot. So I think the two-year note's going to, you know, come down a ton, and 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 I think the ten-year is probably going to hold at or around four percent. So you're, we both like steepening. You yeah. like a bull steepener. I like a bear steepener. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Either way, we like steep. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But with that, Ron Insana, thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Good to see you. Pleasure.